Hi, and welcome back. Our topic today is biotechnology. And as we defined earlier in the semester, science has the goal of gathering knowledge or learning about that physical or natural world around us, whereas technology is taking that scientific information we've learned and actually applying it to a more practical purpose in society. Biotechnology, in particular, is taking our information about DNA and all our information we've learned about DNA sequencing, how genes become expressed or get turned into proteins, and applying that to various uh, applications in our society. Now, one con common theme that we'll see today is that the concepts are relatively easy and straightforward. Maybe we want to snip a gene out of this organism and insert it into a new organism. Um, but the practical applications of these are often extremely difficult. Identifying the genes, working with DNA, uh, which tends to degrade very quickly. And so as we go through today, we'll talk mostly at the level of these concepts. However, we will talk about some of the practical limitations for some of these various applications. The first goal is for gene cloning. And in gene cloning, we're going to take a particular gene of interest, perhaps a, a gene associated with a disease, uh, produce many, many copies of it so that we can study the gene, learn the genetic sequence, and learn the genetic information contained in that gene. The common goal is for what's called gene expression of that particular gene. And so perhaps we want an organism to express a new trait. For example, maybe a crop like corn, which is very susceptible to uh, insect pestis, uh, pests. Perhaps we'd like it to express a protein that's going to be deadly, a toxin to those pests, and therefore the corn could defend itself uh, against these pests without having to spray expensive pesticides on the field. We may try to then clone that gene uh, via recombinant DNA into that corn and get that corn to express that gene. Our first goal within genetic engineering uh, is gene cloning. And in gene cloning, probably the most important aspect is the source DNA. And that source DNA is going to be the gene of interest, the gene that we're really interested in that we want to be able to clone and make many copies of. And certainly by far, most of these source DNAs are actual human genes, genes that are associated with various uh, types of diseases that we want to learn more about. Once we have that source DNA isolated and our gene of interest isolated, then we're going to need some host DNA. And the host DNA uh, is going to be the DNA from the organism that's eventually going to receive that new gene and be able to grow up and copy that new gene for us aspect here of this host DNA is we have to have some sort of shuttle or mechanism to get that source DNA, our gene of interest, into the host because cells don't just randomly take up DNA uh, and start copying that DNA. And so we need a special type of uh, what's called a vector or shuttle that's going to allow us to get our source DNA into the host. Now by far our most common host organism are bacteria. Bacteria are small, they're very easy to grow up in lab, and they have relatively little DNA, and so by far, most human genes have been cloned into bacteria. Now, bacteria have circular DNA, which is different than our long, kind of thin strands of DNA. And in particular, they have many small circular pieces of DNA called plasmids. And so we take advantage of these naturally occurring plasmids and use them as our vector or our host DNA to get our gene of interest into our cell. Now to do this, we're going to be, have to be able to chop up our DNA into small pieces. We want to be able to isolate our gene of interest and then physically splice it or blend it into that plasmid or that vector. And to do that, we use a special type of enzyme called a restriction enzyme. Now restriction enzymes are naturally occurring in bacteria. There are literally hundreds of different types of these restriction enzymes, uh, and they serve as a natural defense in bacteria. They chop up DNA that's injected by viruses as part of the, the bacterial's defense system. Now each of these enzymes cut DNA at very specific sites. So they're not randomly chopping up DNA into little pieces, but they only cut the DNA at very specific sequences. And we're certainly going to take advantage of these naturally occurring enzymes, purify them, and then use them in biotechnology for many applications, one of these applications being our gene cloning that we're looking at here. So if we take a look at these restriction enzymes, an example of how they work. Restriction enzymes are going to cut at a very specific site, and so in this case, this particular restriction enzyme will chop the DNA up every time it comes across the sequence of GAATC. When it does cut the DNA, it cuts it into these two pieces, and it leaves these overhangs, which are referred to as kind of sticky ends or sticky pieces. That vector cut with that enzyme, we're going to cut our source DNA with the exact same enzyme and that's going to create the same sticky ends that are sticking over the edge. And notice that the sticky ends of one piece, TTAA, will match and chemically bind to the sticky ends of the other piece, the sequence of AATT. And so we're going to add these together and we're going to add some uh, enzymes that are going to cause this DNA to be spliced together and this is going to allow us to combine our host DNA and our vector DNA.
Now, to get our gene clone, to get many copies of our gene clone, the first thing we're going to do is create this piece of recombinant DNA, this piece of DNA made up from DNA from our two different species. And so we're going to take DNA from bacteria, this plasma DNA, and we're going to take DNA, again, typically from a, an animal source like a human, and we're going to chop it up with our restriction enzyme. Okay. Once they're chopped up, then we're going to mix those two pieces together and we're going to splice them together such that now we have our plasmid from our bacteria, but it has our human gene spliced within it. And that piece of DNA then is referred to as recombinant DNA because it has human and bacterial DNA all spliced together. Once we have recombinant DNA, then we need to get our recombinant DNA into our host cell. And we're going to allow our host cell then to do the work for us of our kind of genetic engineering. And so we're going to take our piece of plasmid there, our recombinant DNA, and we're going to get it to uh, be taken in by the bacteria. And this can often be done by a series of hot and cold shocks uh, to the bacteria, which make the bacterial uh, membrane uh, loose, which allows it then to suck up or take in that plasmid or that DNA. Now, once we've got our recombinant DNA in a bacteria cell, then we're good to go. Because then every time this bacteria cell divides, it's going to copy its DNA first. And that is now going to include our DNA that we've inserted. And so by tomorrow morning, if I've got my DNA into bacteria cell, I'll have hundreds if not thousands of cells with that gene in it, and they'll keep replicating over and over and over again. So within a few days, we'll have a millions of copies of my gene, so we have cloned our gene. Now once we've cloned our gene, a typical second application to genetic engineering is to get an organism to express the trait, to make an organism produce a protein that maybe is not normally found in that species. And so once we've got our gene, uh, into our bacteria, we need to be able to turn that gene on to get that bacteria to turn that DNA into RNA into protein and express that. And certainly many, many uh, uses are uh, done through this genetic engineering and this expression of these genes. Some human genes uh, are used to make human proteins for medical treatments. Others uh, are used for dyes, like for blue genes, for example. The indigo dye is produced by bacteria that was cloned from a plant cell originally. And in fact, here's a chart looking at some common uh, genetic engineering and recombinant DNA sources. And as we can see here, again, lots of human examples for medical treatment. Human insulin was the first uh, human gene to be cloned. Uh, we see growth hormone, uh, several others here. Notice that the bulk of these hosts are bacteria, the E. coli, the serratia, and so on. Uh, and so typically, because bacteria are easy to use, they make a good host, they're typically what we're going to use to grow these proteins in. However, some proteins are extremely large, and they're too large for the bacteria cell to make. So for those proteins, they have to be cloned into a larger cell, like a mammalian cell. So for example, if we look at the chart, factor eight, which is a blood clotting factor needed to treat hemophilia, is a very large protein. And so that uh, gene has been cloned into mammalian cells, into, in particular into sheep. So that sheep produces factor eight in their milk. Their milk can be harvested every day. We can purify out that factor eight protein and use that for a treatment for hemophilia. Another common application to uh, biotechnology and, genet uh, and genetic engineering is to genetically modify multicellular organisms. And so that's our second application. And in this case, we would take a multicellular organism, like an animal or a plant, and clone our recombinant DNA into that large organism. Now, obviously, this is going to be much more difficult than working with bacteria. There are a lot more uh, practical limitations here. Multicellular organisms have a nucleus. Our cells have a lot more DNA than bacteria. And not only that, but in a bacteria cell, if we get our DNA into one cell, we've done our job. But for these multicellular organisms, we're made up of over a trillion cells. So getting a DNA into one cell doesn't really do much. We need to get our DNA into most of the cells of an organism to get it to express the trait. Now, by and large, most of these genetically modified organisms are either crops or livestock. And our general goal here when we modify these organisms typically is to get a plant or an animal to express a new protein that it normally doesn't express to sort of improve that uh, organism. And again, we'll look at some examples here in just a moment. Or uh, in the case of the medical field, to produce human proteins for medical treatments, like the factor eight example we looked at on the last slide. Cell culture is an older technology. It's been around for maybe a good 40 or 50 years. And cell culture, we take a single plant cell, and if we grow it in a petri dish and we treat it with the correct hormones, we can grow an entire new plant from that cell. And again, this has been around for a very long time, this idea of growing these cells, treating them with the hormones so that some of the cells in the petri dish will develop into roots, some into stems and leaves, and we can grow this entire new plant. And if you've gone to the florist and you're 
kind of look at all the roses and realize, well, why do all those roses look exactly the same? The answer is they've all been cloned from each other. That someone developed this particular species or variety of rose, they chopped it up into a million little bits of rose, and then they're going to clone all those little bits through cell culture so that they all look the same and they get that uniform flower, that uniform color and blossom. And the same thing is true at nurseries if you're looking at all the shrubs or various trees that we see, they've all been cloned through cell culture. Now what's new here is we're going to take this older cell culture technology and utilize it for our uh, genetic engineering. And so when we have a plant cell that we've injected our source DNA into with a viral vector, then we can take that cell and we can grow a whole new plant through cell culture and every cell in that plant then is going to contain that gene of interest. In terms of applications here you might be asking well what are we going to do with these genetically modified plants? One major area where we see a lot of research is to increase the nutritional value of various crops. Crops certainly have many nutrients for us but oftentimes specific crops may be lacking particular nutrients which may then lead to particular disorders within uh, humans. An example of that is a project looking at uh, what's called golden rice. Now we know about a third of the world's population eats rice as a major staple of their diet. And if you're going to eat one thing in your diet, rice is a pretty good choice. It's got lots of nutrients, lots of calories. However, the one main ingredient that's missing in rice is vitamin A. And so oftentimes in these grim countries where we see rice as a staple of your diet, we see vitamin A deficiencies, we see side effects like problems with eyesight associated with lack of vitamin A. So the idea is what if we can add vitamin A into rice so that it would provide all the nutrients necessary. And so Monsanto here in town has been working on this project for a good 15 years or so and they've taken the gene for beta carotene. And beta carotene is the precursor for vitamin A. When we take in beta carotene in our diet, we're going to metabolize that into vitamin A. Okay? Uh, it's beta carotene that's in carrots and that's why mom told you that carrots are good for your eyes. Uh, and in fact beta carotene has an orange or a gold color. So when beta carotene has been cloned into rice, it turns to rice this orange or this golden color. And we can see in the picture here pretty clearly the normal white rice versus the modified uh, golden rice containing beta carotene. Okay? Now when people eat this golden rice, this modified rice, they're going to take in beta carotene. They're going to avoid these problems with vitamin A deficiencies. Another application to these transgenic plants is to somehow add some sort of pest resistance into crops. We've been genetically modifying plants and crops for thousands of years, long before we knew exactly how to modify these plants through our selective breeding. And we've been breeding crops for well over 10,000 years such that the plant spends all of its energy making food, making the grain that we're going to eat. The downside to that is the plants no longer spend any energy defending themselves against various pests uh, out there in the natural world. And so Today, when we grow these crops, we have to spend billions of dollars on these artificial organophosphate pesticides that are going to be used to keep the worms, the insects, the pests off of our crops so that they're not eating the food before we can get to it. Uh, certainly that leads to not only high cost of food, but an awful lot of pollution that's going to end up in our water table, and we've certainly seen that through the years. So the basic idea here is, what if we can add genes into the crop that are going to make it resistant to these pests that are going to either make it taste bad or make it even be poisonous for various pests. Okay? Uh, and an example of that is a series of genes from the uh, bacterial species called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's uh, shortened here as Bt. Uh, Bt cotton was the first of these crops that was uh, tested. They've added these genes in this Bacillus thuringiensis, which usually infects uh, grubs and roundworms and kills them off. And they've taken these toxic genes from this bacteria and they've cloned them into uh, cotton. And here we can see in the petri dish uh, the leaf on the right is a typical cotton that's been infected by these uh, worms. Uh, the leaf on the left is a Bt cotton that's been infected by the same worms. And we can see that the worms took a few bites of the leaf but they didn't survive versus the uh, traditional uh, cotton which has been devastated by that particular crop particular worm. And so what we're seeing is many, many crops have had this Bt gene uh, added. We've got Bt corn, Bt soybean, uh, and so on. In fact, here in Missouri it's estimated uh, that about 80% of all the soybeans grown in Missouri are genetically modified in some way, and about 60% of the corn. And so in reality, the vast majority of crops today are genetically modified as opposed to a traditional crop. Another application with our transgenic plants are genes that are going to influence or synchronize the timing of when fruits and vegetables ripen uh, so that there's less waste, there's less uh, 
uh, over-ripening, fewer raw vegetables and fruits getting to the stores, uh, and it also is going to reduce the cost of uh, harvesting these things. And in fact, the first uh, genetically modified plant of any kind that was sold here in supermarkets in the United States was in about 1994, and that was this brand of tomato called Flavor Saver. And this particular tomato, they had a gene that was added that allowed all these uh, tomatoes to ripen at the same time so that they could be picked mechanically, first of all, but second, they could be picked a little bit earlier before they were ripe, maybe a week or so before the tomatoes were ripe, and then they're shipped to market. And by the time they get to market then, those tomatoes will all be ripe. Again, less waste. There's no going to be overripe or raw, but they're all going to be just right when they get to market. If we compare transgenic plants to transgenic animals, uh, we'll see a lot of similarities, but we'll also see a few differences as well. Uh, if we have a transgenic animal, we're going to genetically engineer or modify an animal, typically by adding one or more genes to that uh, animal. And by and large, most of these animals that are modified are certainly livestock, again, with the main idea of either producing human hormones for medical treatments or for trying to increase the nutritional value of these various livestocks. Now, typically, just like with plants, our vector is going to be a modified virus. So we're going to take animal viruses, remove that harmful DNA, insert our gene of interest, and then we're going to infect that organism. Now, one of the drawbacks here to uh, working with animals is we can't do cell cultures. Our cells don't work the same as plants. We can't take a single human cell, for example, and grow it in a petri dish and have that develop into a whole new clone of that human. And so, uh, because of that, transgenic animals and our uh, success with transgenic animals is about 15 years behind transgenic plants. We're really just now seeing a lot of these transgenic animals in the last five or six years or so. Now to get around this idea of cell culture, how are we going to get our gene into most of the cells in the animal? The way we can do that is to infect an egg cell. By injecting our gene of interest into an egg cell, when that egg gets fertilized then, that egg will contain our gene of interest, and as it grows and develops by mitosis, it's going to copy our gene of interest and pass it on to all the other cells in that animal. Now there are certainly a couple applications here as we look at transgenic animals. Uh, one is sometimes called biofarming, uh, or kind of the pharmacy industry producing these human proteins for medical treatments, and we mentioned that example, that factor eight, a few slides ago. Uh, what we're now seeing are some livestock are being modified to increase the quality of that uh, food product. For example, we're just now seeing some uh, cattle that have been engineered to produce less fat so that we're going to hopefully get a leaner meat and have less fat in our diet by eating that type of uh, meat. Another example here that your book discusses are these sheep uh, cloning a protein for a cystic fibrosis treatment into these sheep. And sheep are often used as the model for transgenic animals because they're smaller and easier to raise than cattle and because they produce milk. And so that we can uh, get our gene expressed into the milk, get, collect the milk every day, purify our protein out, and we have a continual source of this uh, protein for medical treatment uh, within our herd of sheep. Our third uh, application to biotechnology is gene therapy. And in gene therapy, we're actually going to try to alter a human's genes in an attempt to treat some sort of genetic disorder or genetic disease. Now, up until the, really the last 10 or 15 years or so, we've made some certainly some big progress in terms of treating diseases, but we're really addressing the symptoms and not the disease itself. Maybe making the disease less painful, less intrusive into a person's life, uh, but we really haven't done much to actually cure or fix a genetic problem. And so gene therapy represents that first attempt to really go in and fix the DNA that's at the root of the problem. Now, while there are some successful studies, and we'll look at an example here in just a moment, there are certainly a lot of limitations to gene therapy that are kind of slowing down our research on these practical issues. For example, if you were type 1 diabetic and you don't make insulin, perhaps we want to try to get a good copy of that insulin gene into your cells. Well, we don't want to get those, that insulin gene into your skin cells because skin cells don't normally make insulin. We would have to specifically target cell types like your pancreatic cells to get that insulin inside. In addition, not only do we have to get that gene into the right cell, but we have to regulate it. We don't want those pancreatic cells making as much insulin as possible all the time, 24-7. Instead, they need to produce, produce the right amount of insulin at the right time. And then finally, we can't go back to when you were an egg and get those good copy of that gene back into that uh, egg cell. And so how are we going to get enough copies of the gene into enough of your cells that you're going to make the protein that you're missing? These are all some limitations to gene therapy, but some of these are certainly being overcome as we learn more and more about our process of DNA and recombinant technology. Once we've cloned that gene of interest into a virus, then we're going to infect the cells with the virus which will then do the work for us and inject that DNA into the target cells. 
uh, allowing us then to get that good copy of that gene into it. I just want to mention a success story or an example of one of these gene therapy studies that has uh, provided some really tangible benefits for people with this disease. And the disease here is called adenosine deaminase deficiency, or oftentimes it's just abbreviated as ADA. And this is a real typical story of a lot of genetic disorders. As humans, we've got over 250,000 different proteins that we have to make to have normal health. In this case, this adenosine deaminase is an enzyme. Normally, this enzyme works in your blood cells. It breaks down toxic chemicals. Uh, protein byproducts into urea, which eventually then you get rid of as waste product in your urine. If you don't have this enzyme, that's what causes the symptoms of this disease, is adenosine deaminase deficiency. That means these chemicals are not removed. Instead, they build up and become toxic. They interfere with your cell's normal chemistry, and the result is T cells start dying off. And remember, T cells are a very critical component in your normal immune response for defending your body against bacteria and viruses. So that if you have this ADA, you're going to lack T cells, you're not going to have a functioning immune system. And ADA historically has been very fatal, uh, usually very early in life, in infants six months or less typically it's uh, fatal for, because they simply don't have an immune system to defend their body against infection. And this major symptom is called SCID, which stands for Severe, severe Combined Immune Deficiency. Uh, and again, when people die of ADA, it's not the ADA necessarily that's deadly, it's the lack of the immune system and infection by other uh, organisms like pneumonia, for example, that causes the fatality. And you may have heard of this disease before, sometimes referred to as the boy in the bubble disease. Uh, a young man named David in the late 1970s had a mild form of this disease and he lived uh, past infancy and he lived isolated, completely separated by plastic uh, from the rest of society as a way to sort of keep bacteria off of him uh, so he didn't sustain one of these severe infections. If we take a look at this ADA, this first chart just shows us the metabolic pathway, and on the left is the normal pathway. These protein byproducts get broken down gradually by many small steps into uric acid, and again, they're removed and they become harmless. But if you're missing this critical adenosine deaminase enzyme, those toxic chemicals build up, and they're going to destroy your T cells. Okay. In fact, here is uh, David. He was from uh, West Texas. This is a picture of him and his mom, and again, in the late 70s. Uh, unfortunately, David uh, passed away when he was 12 years old. He was getting a uh, bone marrow transplant in an attempt to try to cure the, or fix the disease, uh, and unfortunately, he got an infection and did not survive. So let's look at the treatment history of ADA and then how gene therapy has changed the basic treatment. Uh, up until, again, the early 80s, the only treatment was to isolate the patient. And most patients didn't survive past the first year or so after birth because of infection. And David had a relatively mild form, so it was unusual for someone with ADA to live uh, as long as David lived. By the mid-1980s, though, they had isolated this adenosine deaminase, and they realized that's the protein that's missing. That's the cause of all these symptoms with the immune system. So because adenosine deaminase is derived from blood cells, a good source of blood is a slaughterhouse. And so doctors went to slaughterhouses, they collected large amounts of cattle blood, and they purified cattle adenosine deaminase enzyme. And they used that as an experimental treatment. And sure enough, they saw that when people with ADA got treated with this cattle adenosine deaminase, the enzyme survived in their system and started to function, started to actually break down these toxins, and the uh, toxin levels went down and T cells started to survive. Now, these enzymes don't last long, and this is a, a shot that these patients had to receive several times a day, every day. By the late 80s, early 90s, doctors had isolated the gene in our cells that codes for this adenosine deaminase protein. They had cloned it through genetic engineering into bacteria through recombinant DNA, just as we talked about earlier uh, in this lecture, so, so that bacteria were now producing human adenosine deaminase. And so we could replace that cattle ADA with human ADA, and we saw that the human ADA lasts longer in our system and is more effective at breaking down these proteins. So that was certainly a step in the right direction. Uh, but again, these enzyme treatments have to be taken several times a day. It's very invasive, but certainly a huge leap forward from that isolation of the bubble. Now gene therapy then is attempting to cure or fix this problem by actually going in and fixing the mutated uh, gene. As we look at the gene therapy then treatment strategy here for treating ADA, the idea is we want to fix those blood cells. Can we get a good copy of that gene into blood cells so they produce the right protein and remove these toxic chemicals? Now, ADA lends itself to a gene therapy study pretty well because we can take your blood cells and remove them from your body, a small portion of them at a time, adjust them, 
genetically and return them. We certainly couldn't do that with a brain disorder or a bone or a muscle disorder. And so the first attempts uh, in the uh, early 90s were to remove the blood cells, get a good copy of that ADA gene into those blood cells, and then return those genetically modified cells back into the patient. And when they did this, they saw that those cells that were modified did survive in the patient, they did produce the right enzyme, and we saw T cell levels increase and the immune system start to function normally. Now the only problem with this uh, gene therapy uh, study with these blood cells is that it's a temporary fix because remember our blood cells only survive only about maybe two to four weeks in our system and so these modified cells are gradually dying off and they're being replaced uh, by the body by new blood cells that have the mutated gene in them and so they're non-functioning proteins in those new cells. The next stage in the gene therapy uh, trial then was to try to get a more permanent fix. Can we somehow get these modified cells to survive and to be reproduced in your body. And so what they did in this particular case is there was a couple that had a child who was born with ADA and died as an infant. Several years later they had a second child and during the uh, pregnancy they did a genetic screen and found out sure enough this developing uh, child did have ADA. And so at birth what they did is they had this very aggressive treatment very early on and they isolated some cord blood cells. And the blood cells in the cord blood contain not only blood, but they also have stem cells, which are bone marrow cells, that generate your blood cells. So these are the cells that reproduce by mitosis and replace your red and your white blood cells. So they collected these at birth. After the infant had uh, time to recover and gain strength after birth, they took these cord blood cells, cloned a functioning copy of the ADA gene in, and then they did a bone marrow transplant which obviously is a really invasive procedure, but they went in and removed bone marrow, not from all of the bone, but from many of the bones of this infant, and replaced it with these modified marrow cells. The idea being that now when these modified cells divide, they're going to produce blood cells that have a functioning copy of the gene that's going to produce the right protein. Now when they first did this study, they really thought it was a failure, because up until about two years old, this girl whose name was Ashanti, up until she was about two, they really saw very minimal effect. They didn't see very many blood cells surviving like they thought they would. But after the age of two, they gradually saw more and more blood cells within the girl's system that contained the correct gene and that were producing the correct uh, protein, this correct enzyme. Uh, and so that's a more permanent fix in this case. Now the little girl, and here she is uh, with one of her doctors and her team when she was about uh, four or five years old. Here she is when she was about 13. Now she's about 18 years old and she's living just fine with basically no medication. She's producing her own enzyme through her own blood cells. And so really this is a pretty uh, amazing feat if we think about going from a fatal disease and with the only treatment being we're going to isolate you behind a piece of plastic in the 1970s to 30 years later where we can almost treat this disease and fix this disease where there's no real invasive treatment for this young lady.